consistency, proportionate adjustment of life problems. He pointed out that overmuch sympathy and pity may degenerate into serious emotional instability, that enthusiasm may drive on into fanaticism. He discussed one of their former associates whose imagination had led him off into visionary and impractical undertakings. At the same time, he warned them against the dangers of the dullness of over-conservative mediocrity. And then Jesus discoursed on the dangers of courage and faith, how they sometimes lead unthinking souls on to recklessness and presumption. He also showed how prudence and discretion, when carried too far, lead to cowardice and failure. He exhorted his hearers to strive for originality while they shunned all tendency toward eccentricity. He pleaded for sympathy without sentimentality, piety without sanctimoniousness. He taught reverence free from fear and superstition. It was not so much what Jesus taught about the balanced character that impressed his associates as the fact that his own life was such an eloquent exemplification of his teaching. He lived in the midst of stress and storm, but he never wavered. His enemies continually laid snares for him, but they never entrapped him. The wise and learned endeavored to trip him, but he did not stumble. They sought to embroil him in debate, but his answers were always enlightening, dignified, and final. When he was interrupted in his discourses with multitudinous questions, his answers were always significant and conclusive. Never did he resort to ignoble tactics in meeting the continuous pressure of his enemies, who did not hesitate to employ every sort of false, unfair, and unrighteous mode of attack upon him. While it is true that many men and women must assiduously apply themselves to some definite pursuit as a livelihood vocation, it is nevertheless wholly desirable that human beings should cultivate a wide range of cultural familiarity with life as it is lived on earth. Truly educated persons are not satisfied with remaining in ignorance of the lives and doings of their fellows. 5. Lesson Regarding Contentment when Jesus was visiting the group of evangelists working under the supervision of Simon Zelotes, during their evening conference, Simon asked the Master, Why are some persons so much more happy and contented than others? Is contentment a matter of religious experience? Among other things, Jesus said in answer to Simon's question, Simon, some persons are naturally more happy than others. Much, very much, depends upon the willingness of man to be led and directed by the Father's Spirit which lives within him. Have you not read in the Scriptures the words of the wise man? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts. And also that such spirit-led mortals say, The lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a goodly heritage. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For a good man shall be satisfied from within himself. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance and is a continual feast. Better is a little with the reverence of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted ox and hatred therewith. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without rectitude. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Better is a handful with composure than a superabundance with sorrow and vexation of spirit. Much of man's sorrow is born of the disappointment of his ambitions and the wounding of his pride. Although men owe a duty to themselves to make the best of their lives on earth, having thus sincerely exerted themselves, they should cheerfully accept their lot and exercise ingenuity in making the most of that which has fallen into their hands. All too many of men's troubles take origin in the fear soil of his own natural heart. The wicked flee when no man pursues. The wicked are like the troubled sea, for it cannot rest, but its waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says God, for the wicked." Seek not, then, for false peace and transient joy, but rather for the assurance of faith and the sureties of divine sonship which yield composure, contentment, and supreme joy in the Spirit. Jesus hardly regarded this world as a veil of tears. He rather looked upon it as the birth sphere of the eternal and immortal spirits of paradise ascension, the veil of soul-making. 6. The Fear of the Lord it was at Gamala, during the evening conference, that Philip said to Jesus, Master, why is it that the Scriptures instruct us to fear the Lord, while you would have us look to the Father in heaven without fear? 
How are we to harmonize these teachings? And Jesus replied to Philip, saying, My children, I am not surprised that you ask such questions. In the beginning it was only through fear that man could learn reverence, but I have come to reveal the Father's love, so that you will be attracted to the worship of the Eternal by the drawing of a son's affectionate recognition and reciprocation of the Father's profound and perfect love. I would deliver you from the bondage of driving yourselves through slavish fear to the irksome service of a jealous and wrathful King God. I would instruct you in the father-son relationship of God and man, so that you may be joyfully led into that sublime and supernal free worship of a loving, just, and merciful Father God. The fear of the Lord has had different meanings in the successive ages, coming up from fear through anguish and dread to awe and reverence. And now from reverence I would lead you up through recognition, realization, and appreciation to love. When man recognizes only the works of God, he is led to fear the Supreme. But when man begins to understand and experience the personality and character of the living God, he is led increasingly to love such a good and perfect, universal and eternal Father. And it is just this changing of the relation of man to God that constitutes the mission of the Son of Man on earth. Intelligent children do not fear their father in order that they may receive good gifts from his hand. But having already received the abundance of good things bestowed by the dictates of the father's affection for his sons and daughters, these much-loved children are led to love their father in responsive recognition and appreciation of such munificent beneficence. The goodness of God leads to repentance, the beneficence of God leads to service, the mercy of God leads to salvation while the love of God leads to intelligent and free-hearted worship. Your forebears feared God because he was mighty and mysterious. You shall adore him because he is magnificent in love, plenteous in mercy, and glorious in truth. The power of God engenders fear in the heart of man, but the nobility and righteousness of his personality beget reverence, love, and willing worship. A dutiful and affectionate son does not fear or dread even a mighty and noble father. I have come into the world to put love in the place of fear, joy in the place of sorrow, confidence in the place of dread, loving service and appreciative worship in the place of slavish bondage and meaningless ceremonies. But it is still true of those who sit in darkness that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But when the light has more fully come, the sons of God are led to praise the infinite for what he is, rather than to fear him for what he does. When children are young and unthinking, they must necessarily be admonished to honor their parents. But when they grow older and become somewhat more appreciative of the benefits of the parental ministry and protection, they are led up through understanding respect and increasing affection to that level of experience where they actually love their parents for what they are more than for what they have done. The father naturally loves his child, but the child must develop his love for the father from the fear of what the father can do, through awe, dread, dependence, and reverence, to the appreciative and affectionate regard of love. You have been taught that you should fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of man. But I have come to give you a new and higher commandment. I would teach you to love God and learn to do his will for that is the highest privilege of the liberated sons of God. Your fathers were taught to fear God, the Almighty King. I teach you, love God, the All-Merciful Father. In the kingdom of heaven, which I have come to declare, there is no high and mighty king. This kingdom is a divine family. The universally recognized and unreservedly worshipped center and head of this far-flung brotherhood of intelligent beings is my father and your father. I am his son, and you are also his sons. Therefore it is eternally true that you and I are brethren in the heavenly estate, and all the more so since we have become brethren in the flesh of the earthly estate. Cease then to fear God as a king or serve him as a master. Learn to reverence him as the creator, honor him as the father of your spirit youth, love him as a merciful defender, and ultimately worship him as the loving and all-wise father of your more mature spiritual realization and appreciation. Out of your wrong concepts of the Father in heaven grow your false ideas of humility and springs much of